Good morning. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to church, to Williams this morning. Um, since we've been without sun for a few days, let's brighten the place up. You know what you need to do. The person to your right and your left, give them a big smile. Okay, go. If everyone could grab their bulletins, so let's see what's going on here at Williams. Now, if you're visiting this morning, welcome again. Um, we would love for you visitors to look at the ends of your pew, and you should have um, a sheet of paper with a couple of questions for you to fill out and turn in in the offering plate. Uh, just so we could have a record of your visit, that would be great. All right, as you can see in the bulletin, if you have it opened, we have evening worship tonight starting at 6 o'clock. We'll meet in here. We're going to be doing a study on Revelation, so that sounds exciting. So come at 6. Um, after the service this morning, if you are a part of the children's ministry, you're having a meeting in the choir room right behind us here. Um, Wednesday night, make sure that you come back for service, uh, but 5.30, you have supper, and on the back of your bulletin, the menu is there, meatloaf. That will start at 5.30, then at 6.30, we'll have our uh, Bible studies for children and adults, but youth, we're going to be leaving at 6 o'clock and going to the assisted living, do a little craft with them. Um, and then one more thing. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. Wednesday, also Wednesday, after the service that evening, you're going to be having a finance committee meeting. So if you're a part of that group, you'll have a meeting, finance. Um, and then Tuesday, something new is going to be happening. So listen up if you are interested. Um, at 545 from 630 in the CMC in our gym area there will be a pound class going on and if you want more details you need to ask Emily Duncan um, but something a new way of doing exercise you're gonna be pounding something obviously um, so come bring a yoga mat three dollars be a part of the fun and lose some weight maybe all righty so there's other things going on written in the bulletin, so please read about all this interesting stuff, okay? All righty, now it's my time to hush and your time to yap. Find someone to say good morning to this morning, kiss on the cheek, or give a big hug and shake hands. Go. Good morning. In case you don't remember, uh, my name is uh, Chris Thomas. <laughs> Seriously, y'all, I've been gone for like ever, right? I mean, it feels like forever. It's so good uh, to be home. Um, I wish I could tell you that Sally and Cole are here with us this morning, uh, but they're skipping church, and they're not watching this, so we can say that this morning. <laughs> no, uh, Cole's been doing great. He slept through the night, and was having breakfast as I went out the door this morning, but they'll they'll be with us soon, sort of wade into the water, and you'll get to, to see them, and uh, I hope soon, very soon. So, uh, Again, it is good to be home. One thing I, I forgot to ask um, Nikki to mention, our Tuesday Bible study resumes this week. So if you've been waiting on that, that starts back this week, Tuesday at 10 o'clock, we meet uh, over in the senior suite, uh, and then usually uh, go out to eat together. So... Uh, Come for the food, stay for the Bible study, if you want to come. So, um, but that starts back this week, uh, this Tuesday. So, uh, again, it is so good to be home, and by that I don't mean just in my house, 
uh, in my bed, but to be here this morning with so many of my friends and family here at Williams. And as we've come together, as we've come home to worship, let us start our time together with a word of prayer. Great God, we come to you this morning, Lord, with full hearts. Lord, they're full of joy, some of us. Some of us, our hearts are full of grief and anguish. But Lord, we come to you with our hearts and turn them over to you in this time of worship. God, we pray as we have gathered in this place on this rainy Sunday morning, that as we have gathered that our offerings of praise will be worthy to you, God, and that you will join us in this place, speak to our hearts, speak to us in the ways Lord, that we need to be spoken to, to be encouraged, to be comforted, to be challenged, to be convicted. May you speak to us through the words of hymns, through the words of prayers, the words of scripture, through the testimony of those who sing, who those who sit near us, who share in this time of worship with us. May you speak to us, Lord, and may we hear and obey. So be with us now, Lord, in this time of worship, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Our scripture call to worship this morning is Psalm 8. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowded them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands, and you put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds, and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky, and the fish in the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Good morning. If you will take a hymn and hymn on and turn to page 514. In my heart there rings a melody. Let's stand and sing all three stanzas. Please stand as we sing. hymn this morning is hymn 65 the wonder of it all we'll sing both stanzas and before we start this i, I just want to mention that uh, 
tonight in choir practice, we'll start working on some Christmas programs. So any of you who don't sing in a choir normally, they're interested in singing a Christmas program, please come tonight at 5 o'clock. Okay? All right. 65, we'll sing both stanzas. this morning good good do you think y'all have a mat sitting outside your door mm, no no not at your house you don't have a mat that you wipe your feet on oh no, yes I yes yeah well, i was gonna bring mine this morning but it's a little bit dirty and the ones we found around they were a little bit dirty too what's that mat say on it i have one do you have one does it have words on it no no i do what's your what does yours say mm. does it say welcome yeah, welcome. Mine says welcome. It's red, white, and blue, and it says welcome across it. And you know what? Today our story is from Mark 10, and it's talking about how Jesus welcomed the little children. Just like we welcome you up here every morning, Jesus was telling a story to a group of people, and all of these children came forward, and they were coming. And I know we've learned about it because I remember the Holy Moly video on it. And they were yeah. running to him. And what did the disciples do? What did the disciples try to do? Block. Yeah, they tried to block them. They tried to tell them to stop. And Jesus said, no, 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 you've got it wrong. Whoever welcomes these little children welcomes me. And right now we're in the season of Pentecost, learning to grow closer to God. And you know what our job is? Do you know what God tells us to do? That we're to make others feel welcome. Have y'all ever been somewhere that you didn't feel very welcomed? Nope. You have? That maybe it was a strange situation and you just didn't know what to do. Maybe you didn't have any friends. What about the first day of school? Um, Sometimes is that hard? Well... This year it wasn't. This, why was it not hard this year? Because my best friend was in this Because you had friends in there, right? Uh -huh. My best friend was in my class. Yeah, so when you have friends, it's a little bit easier to feel welcomed, isn't it? But I, did you? I had one friend, which was Ada. You had one friend, which was Ada. So you were in Miss Hedgepath's room, too. So that made it a little bit easier, didn't it, to come in and you knew somebody. And then that way you didn't have to be as scared, did you? It's the first time I was a little nervous. Yeah, we 
getting a little nervous. Well, did you know the other people that we don't know, that they're new to somewhere? I only had one. I only had one one friend, which was just my, my cousin. <coughs> which was your cousin, and that's always good to have a friend. And this year but she has Isaac. Yeah, as his that's good. But you know, we have people in our room and people that we see every day that they may be a little bit different. They may not look the same as us. They may not talk the same as us. But do you know what Jesus tells us our job is? To be nice to them. What did we learn this morning in Sunday school? To what? Be, be good to be good to others. So as you go this week, and if you see somebody having a tough time at school, maybe they don't have a lot of friends, maybe that they fall and get hurt, you can help them up. Or maybe you can just be there for them and be their friend and be nice to them. Y'all think y'all can do that this week? Yeah. All right, let's say a prayer. Dear Lord, we just pray as we go through this week, Lord, that you'll help us be kind to others and that we'll welcome everyone in your name just like you welcome the little children and help us to remember to do the things you would have us to do. In your name, amen. All right, the three and fours are going, but no children's church because the floors are messed up, okay? So as soon as the floors get fixed, then we'll start having children's church again, okay? All right, threes and fours, y'all may go. The operatory hymn this morning is hymn 504, He Touched Me. And ushers, there's only two verses to this, so we'll sing both verses. The stands we sing. Would you join me now in a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, we come in thanksgiving, first of all, this morning, thanking you for, uh, for allowing us to come into your house and to worship you and uh, to share love and fellowship and see each other smile, Father. Strengthen us to, uh, to share your love with others. Uh, build us up, Father, to, uh, to where we can do that in this world, in this hurting world, Father. Help us to, to love others and share with, share with us what we have, what you've blessed us with. We thank you so much for loving us. In Jesus' name, amen.
Lord be with you. Good, you didn't forget how to do that. That's good. Well, I invite you to turn with me in your copy of Holy Scripture to the 10th chapter of Mark's Gospel. And as you're turning there, I want to say, even though they're not here, a word of thanks to all of our friend Bob Ford uh, for filling in. Uh, uh, somebody told me Bob must be slipping. He was getting long-winded. Went, <laughs> went a whole 12 minutes one Sunday. And then, of course, uh, Kelly. Uh, I, I heard great things about Kelly's time here, both from several of you and from Kelly herself. And then uh, my thanks, I, I said it this morning to them, I don't say thanks enough to our deacons for just uh, the way that they serve. But uh, one person I do need to thank is probably Peggy. Uh, where are you at? Peggy just, um, y'all, Peggy does most of the work around here. I don't know if y'all know that. And so thank you, Peggy, for I don't say that enough in front of everybody, but thank you uh, for what you do. And, um, we all do that more often for her, don't you think? Thank you, Peg. Well, we'll pick up in Mark chapter 10, uh, beginning with verse 2, and read through verse 16. Some Pharisees came, and to test him, they asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of dismissal and to divorce her. But Jesus said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, he wrote this commandment for you. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh, so they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together... Let no one separate. Then in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. And he said to them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. People were bringing little children to him in order that he might touch them. And the disciples spoke sternly to them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, Let the little children come to me. Do not stop them. For it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly, I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. And he took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. May God and his blessing to the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, giver of the Holy Spirit, maker of heaven and earth, the only one who is worthy of our praise and adoration. Lord, we come to you this morning asking to hear a word from you, a word that you speak to us through the Holy Spirit and the pages of Holy Scripture. And as we come this morning, Lord, I want to lift up to you all the concerns of our hearts. Lord, again, we hear this week of another shooting in another place to the point, Lord, where it almost seems routine. God, we pray, Lord, in words we can't express, the grief and loss that is there. And Lord, we pray for an answer. And Lord, this morning we pray the news of tragedy and devastation, even here in our own community. We lift them up to you. We pray for all of those things in our lives, God, that cause us grief, cause us pain. Lord, we pray not that you make them go away and whitewash it with joy. That you make us mindful that you are here with us, even in the midst of these things. And Lord, now as we turn to Holy Scripture, may we hear in its words a word from you, a word that calls us to change, a word that calls us closer into relationship with you, and may we obey what we hear. In your holy name we pray, amen. I remember when I first learned what it meant that my parents were divorced. I was in Miss Stinson's kindergarten class. 
at Rucker Boulevard Elementary School in Enterprise. And I remember it was one of those days, I don't know if it was a Friday or a Monday, but I'm sure it was one or the other. Because Ms. Stinson had asked us to draw a picture of what we were going to do or what we had done over the weekend. And so I got a piece of construction paper and I got my few crayons. If I haven't told you before, the way we did this when I was growing up, I had three stepbrothers, a stepsister, and a sister in the house. And Mama bought like the big box of crayons and then just divided them amongst us. And so if you got bronze or burnt sienna, you were stuck <laughs> with burnt sienna. In fact, I remember another time, this is, this is way off track, but I, you know what, I ain't been here a while, y'all ain't heard a story. When I was in kindergarten at another school, I remember having to color a pig. I may have shared this with you. I colored it red because I didn't have a pink. <laughs> but anyway, back to the story. So I pulled out my construction paper, my handful of crayons, and a Ziploc bag, probably. And I did what we all do, right? When you were a kid, some of us may do it as adults still. When you draw, what do you do? You draw that little thick green line on the bottom. That's the earth, right? A thick blue line at the top because that's the sky. We all have, you, there's a term for this. It's called a three-tiered view of the universe, earth, the middle, and the sky. And then maybe, I'm sure child psychologists know that there's probably some significance to where you put the sun. I always put mine over in the right corner. I think that means you're a genius. I'm not sure. <laughs> but I draw it over in the corner in yellow or orange or burnt sienna, whatever color. <laughs> Then I draw a house with a red crayon. It was always a colonial style house, even though I knew no one who lived in a colonial. I knew no one who had a red house. And then I had a black crayon, and I started drawing a dog. <clears throat> Miss Stinson came over, and she said, well, Chris, tell me about, about your drawing. I said, oh, well, that's my daddy's house, and that's my dog, Poochie. And I'm going over to my daddy's house this weekend to play with my dog. And I remember one of the kids at the table, and she may not have said it like this, but this is how I remember it. Why does your daddy live somewhere else? Your daddy doesn't live in the house with you? Like, no, yours does. <laughs> I thought everybody lived that way. I thought everybody went to their dad's house on the weekends to play with their dogs, to play with their cousins who lived at their grandma's house next door. And so when I got in the car that afternoon, I asked my mom, why didn't daddy live with us? Why did I have two sort of daddies and two sort of mommies? And she tried to explain as best she could to a five-year-old in 1989 what divorce was. Now, that was 1989, it's kindergarten, kids don't know. It's 2015, and I think it, I'm not taking much of a risk to say every single one of us in here, in one way or another, has been touched by divorce, whether our parents were, whether we were, whether our children were. And I want to say, before I say anything else, uh, the best thing I've ever heard is divorce is something that happens to you. It's not who you are. So I want you to hear that from me. That, that, that's not something that makes you less of a person. It doesn't make you less in the eyes of God. It doesn't do any of those things. It's something that happens. There's some people who don't need to be married. And it's, it's odd for me to say this, but my parents should have never been married. It's odd for me to say that because I'm an offspring of that marriage. But they should have never been together. It happens. And then, then we read words like this in the Bible. And even mine, even the NRSV, the heading says, teaching about divorce, right? As if Jesus walked around in his day in Galilee and stopped and made grand declarations about social issues of his day or ours, right? That's what it sounds like, but that's not what happened. It'd be nice. Can I tell you that? It would be great. It's one of the things, and I think I can say this, it frustrates me about Jesus, that he never just stopped and said, okay, everybody gather around, I'm going to define marriage for you. Jesus never said, okay, hang on, blessed are the meek, blessed are the poor, yada, 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 this is when life begins. He never said, okay, everybody gather around, uh, make sure somebody writes this down, because it's probably going to make it in the Bible later. Uh, this is when the world began. He didn't do that. In fact, most of the time when Jesus is walking around, it seems to me that he's busy most loving other people. Healing the sick, giving sight to the blind. He's actually doing stuff. So it doesn't surprise me that in this passage that's so often used to say this is what divorce is and what divorce ain't, that the way it starts, the way it starts, Mark tells us, the Pharisees came to test him. 
Now that word's got a barb in it, doesn't it? Test him. I mean, this isn't, we really want to know Jesus, tell us. You know what I'm learning? When people ask me, Chris, what's your opinion? They hardly ever really want to know. You want to know what they want to know? If they agree with me or not. They want to know if they can pick a fight or if we can be friends. I think that's what happened here. The Pharisees come to test Jesus, and they don't test him about theological stuff. Do you notice that? They don't say, okay, Jesus, uh, what is the nature of God? They don't come to test Jesus and say, okay, Jesus, how many animals really were on the ark? They don't come and say, can you name all the books of the Old Testament backwards and forwards? They ask him about divorce, a controversial issue of the day, because for Jews, there were kind of two schools of thought about divorce. Now, before we get there, Jesus, uh, they say, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? You notice that language, is it lawful? What does Jesus say? Jesus, uh, he says in verse 3, well, what did Moses command you? What does the law say? I mean, you want the answer, right? There's the question. What does the law say? Is it lawful? Look it up. Stop by. If, if I had been Jesus, I'd have been a lot less tactful, I think. Is it lawful? I don't know. What's the law say? Stop bothering me with this. What does it say? But he says, what does Moses say? And they say, well, Moses said we could write a certificate of dismissal and divorce her. All right, then Moses said it, go on, leave me alone. I got, I got children to hug. I got the blind to give their sight back to, all these other things, but no. He tells them it's because of their hardness of heart that Moses said these things. And then he goes on to quote from Genesis. From the beginning, God made the male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh, so they are no longer two but one flesh. Oh, that's almost Shakespearean, isn't it? I mean, isn't that, 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 but you know something? That's not really romantic. That's not the point. You and I, I think in our day, at least I know, I, this is how I feel about my wife. She's not here, but I can say this. I mean, I'm in love with my wife. I mean, when I met my wife and we began to date and we, we fell in love with one another and then we got married, that's how it works, Right? Not in the ancient world. You are married out of necessity. A man leaves his mother and father. Why? Because he's all head over heels for a girl? No, because mom and daddy can't support him anymore. He's got to get out of the house. He's got to be a man now. And so a man leaves his mother and father, and then the woman cleaves or clings to his husband. Why? Because she loves him, because he looks like Fabio, because he's got the, the, the disposition of George Clooney or the, the money of Bill Gates? No. Why? Because she has to. Daddy's going to die soon. Brothers don't have to take care of sister. She needs someone to take care of her. She can't have a son without a husband, and she can't have a life without a male and hers. And so she clings to her husband. And so it's not really as romantic as it sounds when we're standing at the altar surrounded by flowers and a white dress and tuxedo. It's a necessity. Jesus says, this is why it happens. That's why he says, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Because if you do, somebody gets hurt. And not just emotionally, but for the long term. For the long haul. Physically. See, there were two schools of thought. I just mentioned that earlier. The two rabbis, two rabbinical schools about divorce. One said, yes, a man can divorce his wife if if she's not really living up to her potential. The idea was if she wasn't pleasing him enough, if she wasn't keeping the house clean enough, if she didn't have dinner on the table at five when he got home from work, well then yeah, I mean that's what was expected of her. Dismiss her, it's okay. Write her a certificate of dismissal, which by the way, this is not just a legal transaction that says we are no longer married. Do you know what a certificate of dismissal, certificate of divorce was? A husband could say to his wife, you are no longer legally married to me, you are free to not be married to me. And if you ever choose to be married again, you got to run it by me. That's what it meant. So he had to okay whoever he, she was going to remarry. So you can bet he wasn't better looking, he wasn't younger, and he didn't have more money. That's what it meant. So one school said, yeah, you can dismiss them if they're not really living up to their potential. The other said, you can dismiss them if they fail you somehow. That's reflected in Matthew's uh, retelling of this story. 
You know, Matthew has a little clause in Jesus' words, right? Uh, he shouldn't divorce her unless she commits porneia, is the Greek word, uh, adultery, fornication, if she uh, uh, you know, commits infidelity. Then Paul even struggles with this some. Paul writes about, well, what do you do if, you, if, if two people can't get along and they're married? Well, if one's an unbeliever and the unbeliever wants to get divorced, you should let them do that just for the sake of peace because the peace of Christ is more important. Then in another place he says, well, you probably shouldn't. You can see it. They're wrestling with it all along. Wrestling with these two ways of thinking, wrestling with the whole thing. And then you throw in the Roman idea where a woman could possibly divorce her husband, and then it just gets messier. So Jesus says these things to the Pharisees. They're trying to test him, trying to trap him, to get him to say something about divorce, something controversial, because that's how John lost his head, you know. John the Baptist said something about the divorce of Herod Antipas, but his new wife didn't like it, and so they chopped his head off. Maybe the Pharisees are like, hey, if we can get him to say something about Herod, maybe, maybe they'll take care of the dirty work. But it's not just the Pharisees who are wondering. You see in verse 10 that the disciples ask him again about this matter. And that's when Jesus says, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. Now, I don't know if you know this, if you recognize it. That's a pretty radical thing to say commits adultery against her. That last, those last two words, against her. Jesus, in this teaching about divorce, that we'd like to make this legalized understanding about marriage and divorce, what Jesus is doing is he's giving value to women. He's saying that well, a woman's not just a piece of property to be owned by marriage. She has some value in life. He commits adultery against her, not just uh, in this vague sense of committing a sin. And he says in verse 12, perhaps Mark adds it, perhaps Jesus says it. If she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. She couldn't have done that. That's an impossibility in Judaism in the day for a woman to divorce her husband. But in the Roman culture, it could happen. Today, it can happen. What Jesus is trying to say is here at the core of this is not just some definition of who can and can't get married, who can and can't be divorced. What's at the very heart of this is the reality of what a kingdom-oriented relationship ought to look like in the first place. Two people who love each other not in this romantic sense, not in this, just in this sense of, of, of providing one thing for the other, but in this deep sense of love and commitment that values one another as a part of the kingdom of God, as individuals created in the image of God. Not just as some social, societal transaction. Now that's not the question the Pharisees asked, is it? It hardly ever is the answer to the question that we ask Jesus, right, that he gives us. It's always something deeper. It's always something more. Now, the lectionary uh, from which I chose this passage includes verses 13 through 16. I thought that was odd at first. Some people, I think, want to make it about, well, Jesus is saying, this is what marriage between a, a husband and wife looks like, and this is how you treat children. But I don't think that's it. I think it's odd. The disciples ask Jesus about this matter, and what's the very next thing they do? Here come some children, and what, is, what do they do? No, no, you get away from us, kid, you bother us. And then something occurred to me. Verse 13 says, People were bringing little children to him in order that he might touch them. Is this their healthy kid, you think? I mean, are these their like happy, smiling, playing in the yard kids? Oh, we need, we need a rabbi to bless our healthy, bouncing baby boy. Maybe. But a thought occurred to me. Maybe it's not. Maybe these are the kids who were born with something wrong. Maybe they're missing their eyes, an ear out of place, their nose isn't formed right, born without a leg, an arm. Children who would have otherwise been thrown out as trash in the ancient world, still thrown out today. I saw many, some of them, just a couple of weeks ago. And here they are, they're bringing them to Jesus. Now, children, even the most healthy children, were to be seen and not heard. 
Women were property. Children were just things that got in the way. And here they are. And Jesus, in verse 14, we're told, was indignant with the disciples. I don't think that's a good, I don't think that's a good word for us in the South to really talk about uh, how frustrated Jesus was with his disciples. The other word we probably can't say because there's kids in here. He was mad. Mad is something. Mad is the place that ain't heaven. How about that? He was mad. They were blocking these children from coming to Jesus. And he's indignant. He says, let these children come to me. Do not stop them. For it is to such as these that the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, belongs. Now, I found that interesting, too. Do you notice Jesus doesn't say these belong to the kingdom of God? What does he say? The kingdom of God belongs to these. That's different. That's a different way to say it. It's an intentionally different way to say it. They're not just in the door. They don't just make it. They don't just make the cut. It belongs to such as these. To children who are to be seen and not heard. And if you can stand it, shut them away so they're not seen. Children who have no worth, no value. The kingdom of God belongs to them. The kingdom of God belongs to those who may otherwise be divorced and separated from their husbands because they don't live up to their potential or what they want. The kingdom of God belongs to those to whom the rest of society has said, you are not worthy, you do not have any value, you are not the same as me. The kingdom of God belongs to such as these. They don't just get in. They're not just a part. They don't just get their hand stamped. They don't just get a ticket. It belongs to them. Now that's strong. It doesn't belong to the Pharisees. It doesn't belong to the priests. It doesn't belong to the scribes. It doesn't belong to the church folks. It belongs to such as these. The ones that the rest of the world looks down on. The ones who are deemed unworthy. The ones who are otherwise written off. Truly I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. And he took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. I imagine was Pharisee standing out in the yard still bickering over divorce. I imagine those disciples sitting there watching, watching as Jesus took these children into his arms, these dirty, snot-nosed kids with Cheerios stuck to their cheeks, with their hair full of spaghetti, with their diapers dirty, these same children. Jesus took them into his arms and blessed them. I bet those disciples felt about that high because the kingdom of God didn't belong to them but to the children. May we receive the kingdom of God like those same children. Unworthy, perhaps unfit, without cause, without need, without being able to get it on our own. Totally, completely dependent. May we receive the kingdom of God as those who are otherwise called unworthy, written off, and unseen and unheard. For otherwise, we will never enter it. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, the one who welcomed children, the one who gave value to women, who upholds those who are otherwise the least of these. Help us, Lord, to see our worth not in ourselves, not in what we can and cannot do, but help us, Lord, to see our worth in our dependence upon you, to receive the kingdom as little children, little children to whom the kingdom belongs. Help us, Lord, not to find your words as as barbs, as spears to throw at one another. 
but as words that awaken us to the realities of the kingdom of God. So Holy Spirit, come and move in our presence. Speak to our hearts. Help us, Lord, to have ears to hear, eyes to see. Most of all, Lord, help us to have hearts open to love and hands and feet to do your will. We pray these things in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Hymn of invitation this morning is uh, 463, Precious Lord, Take My Hand. We'll sing both stanzas. Please stand as we sing. Well, we've got some great news and some great news this morning. I'm going to ask you if you guys would come. Jason and Michelle, you get that right? Yeah. Yes. Man, my brain has been so scrambled since China. Um, well, Jason, Michelle, and their family have come this morning. Uh, they've been visiting with us for a while, and uh, they expressed their desire to join this family of faith this morning. And so um, I guess they, all who are rejoicing with them say amen. Amen. And the rest of you, we don't want you anyway. And so, no, we're glad you guys are here. I'm going to ask you just to hang out up here at front. You guys come by and uh, let them know you're, you're happy that they're here with us and that they've joined us together. So thank you, guys. And now, uh, the other bit of good news we've got, Jack, if Patty and Sean want to come. Jack and I talked this morning, and uh, Jack has accepted the Lord and would like to be, follow him in believer's baptism. And so, again, all who rejoice with him say, amen, amen. amen. And I'm going to you guys know Jack, Sean, but I'm going to ask them to hang out up here uh, too, and you come by and let them know how happy you are for them, and what a great day it has been here in the house of the Lord. Uh, selfishly, it's been good for me just to be back with family and friends, and uh, as we go out from this place, would you join me in a word of prayer? Lord God, we thank you so much for the ways that you bless us, God, the ways that your spirit moves in our midst, and pray you go with us from this place with joy in our hearts that we may join one another back here again very soon. In your name we pray, amen.